Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's Facebook Live event brought to you by KATV and CHI St. Vincent Heart Institute. Our two organizations have been uh, teamed up to bring you a series of programs focused on your heart health. This is number four in that series, and tonight we hope to bring you information that could save a life. We're pleased to be joined tonight by cardiovascular surgeon uh, Dr. Michael Bauer. He specializes in uh, cardiovascular surgery at CHI St. Vincent Cardiovascular Surgery Center in Little Rock. That's a mouthful, but uh, yeah. good to be with you. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here tonight. We're going to be talking with Dr. Bauer this evening about what patients need to know before they undergo any kind of a heart procedure. He'll be answering questions about that uh, from me. We hope to, to take your questions as well, but some technical difficulties have uh, prevented our live feed tonight, but still uh, we hope to be very informative over the next, this next uh, half hour or so. But anyway, doctor, good to be with you. How long have you been a, a cardiovascular surgeon? About 30 years. Okay. What, what was it that appealed to you that, uh, about this specialty in medicine? What was it about the heart that appealed to you? Well, I, I, I enjoyed the operations. It's very dynamic and clean, and there's a lot of movement in the chest versus general surgery, which is, you know, slower. And it was just a lot of fun. There's immediate results. Uh, it's fast, and it's, it's always exciting. And it doesn't get boring. So it's, <laughs> I bet. It's, it's, a, it's still that way. Never a dull moment. And right. your, your dad was a surgeon as well, correct? Right. He was a general surgeon, so I spent a lot of time with him in the operating room. And actually, I was going to be a, uh, a general surgeon, his partner. And then I got on the cardiac service with in New York with some southern fellows, and they liked me. And we got together, and they let me do some heart surgery, not you know complicated stuff. And I got hooked on it, and, and I, it's the best thing I ever did in medicine. I just... Glad I made that path. I bet. Yeah. And, and it's a generational thing. Your son yeah. is in practice with you now as well. My right? son swore he'd never be a doctor, <laughs> and he swore he'd never be a surgeon, and he said, I'm for sure, never going to be a heart surgeon. And now he is, and it's great to have him. He's been in practice two years, and he's uh, he heads up our ECMO and left heart assist program at St. Vincent's, Fantastic. and he does regular heart surgery, but that's his. His main gig. I know any father out there can, can feel the pride that you have in yeah. that. A uh, rough estimate of the number of heart procedures that you've performed over the years. Any idea? Oh, uh, <laughs> between, I don't know, 10 and 15,000. Wow, that's incredible. Three today, in fact, you said. Well, three operations. They weren't, one was a heart operation. Oh, okay. that was, fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, w what has a patient typically experienced by the time they present to you? For, for surgery? Usually before they come to us, um, they are diagnosed by a cardiologist with whatever they have, either coronary artery disease, they have a heart cath and have blocks, blockages, and then decisions made how to treat them, either with a stent or medical management, or if they need heart surgery, they get sent to the heart surgeon, and we talk about that. Uh, sometimes they'll come from their family doctors to hear a murmur. Uh, but usually they they go through the track of a cardiologist first, and okay. then the cardiologist uh, sends them to us. Is there typically, uh, in your experience, more uh, of an urgency for someone who is experiencing some <clears throat> kind of cardiac problem versus maybe uh, uh, some other malady that, that they would present to their doctor? Well, yeah. And, and is that justified? No, I think it is. I mean, it, it you know, people have a sense about their heart, and my stepfather, who was an engineer, used to say, you're not supposed to feel your heart. And mm -hmm. he's right. I've always remembered that. And uh, so people have a sense about, especially that, uh, if they're having arrhythmias or they're just not feeling right. But if they're made it, the diagnosis is made, the cardiologist will tell them whether you need to get, it, get going now. And we operate on people the same day we meet them. We operate on people within an hour after they hit the ER. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just depends on the acuity of it. Right. Right. Well, walk us through that process of, of how you first meet a patient. What what happens? So what will usually happen if it's a if it's a elective case? That means they have an opportunity to come to the office, bring their family. They fill out a form. They meet with my, my first nurse that goes through that, and then they come to the exam room, and we sit and we talk and go through their form and their history, and then uh, do an exam, and then we visit about the operation and and try to tell them exactly what it's going to be and. Sometimes I'll draw them a picture, usually if it's valve, or show them their graph. Sometimes I'll even show them their films. It, it's very impressive when they actually see their films, mm -hmm. uh, their car cardiac cath or their echo. It's like, you know, wow, I, I've got this problem and, you know, I need to get it fixed. So it's, it puts it real for them. And then after that, we'll schedule them for their operation and they come in and they have it. 
Okay. Uh, you obviously uh, do this a lot, but, but for a patient, it's got to be new. So I know that there are questions that it's important that patients ask their doctor. Can, can you walk us through what, what are kind of the most important questions that people need to ask? Well, you know, um, if I was going to have an operation, knowing what I know, a heart operation, the first thing I'd want to know is my diagnosis correct, mm -hmm. okay? And then if, if, and it should be, okay? Doesn't mean it always is. The second thing I'd want to know if I'm talking to surgeon is do I absolutely have to have an operation? Right. Uh, and what's the, what's the alternative to that operation? If I don't have an operation, then what's gonna happen to me? And uh, that's critical to feeling like you're doing the right thing. Cause it's a big, uh, obviously a big deal. I mean, having your chest opened up and anesthesia and getting over it and the, the dis disruption of your life for a while and it's scary so uh, I would be sure I was my diagnosis was correct I'd be sure that the surgeon was adept at the operation you know it's not like yeah I always think about it's kind of funny when you get on an airplane you don't get to interview the pilot you just hope he can fly <laughs> that's right and get you where you're supposed to go with it and when it comes to picking your surgeon or heart surgeon you have an opportunity to to actually shop around and, and get, get a chance to interview your surgeon um, as well as him getting to examine you. So it's a, it's a it, you should look around and know your stuff. You get on the internet, there's so much information now. Right. Uh, so that's the important part. And, and do you find that people are appropriately curious beforehand? Oh yeah, there's, there, there's, there's two types of patients. They come in and say, I don't wanna know anything, just fix me. You still have to tell them and then the ones that come in, they have a list of questions and they're usually very informed. I mean, before the internet, they didn't necessarily have all that, but, and, uh, and it's good, so. Okay, uh, glad to tell everyone we have resolved some technical problems and we are now live on Facebook, so we are going to be able to, to ask some of your questions as we continue on uh, with our conversation. Dr. Michael Bauer from uh, CHI St. Vincent, I'm Chris May. Um, determining if a surgery is right for a patient with a heart condition, how do you, how do you make that determination? So uh, you have to I mean, decide if they need it, like, like we just said, but if, whether it's right for them, I think the biggest thing you have to decide is is survivable. Mm -hmm. Because there's people that there need an operation, sometimes complex operations, and particularly the Age, ages are getting older and uh, uh, whether a person actually is going to make it through the operation, I usually say you, know, you, can, you can fix the motor but you don't want to wreck the car while you're doing it and that's, right. some people just can't get through an operation. So that's a big part of figuring out if the operation is right for them. Then there's just, there, a lot of times it's just clear cut, you just, it's not a, hard to decide. And they, they know they need it. What are the most common types of procedures that, that you perform at, at St. So, Vincent? So it used to be bypass operations. Mm -hmm. So I did about a third of my operations for bypass now, but the other two thirds are usually valve operations, mentally invasive operations, uh, comp, you know, valve and bypass operations. So we just about do everything at St. Vincent's. Our group can pretty much do anything uh, that is needed. I, I've been told that, that you're especially keen on minimally invasive techniques, which you just mentioned. What, what exactly are we talking about when we say minimally so invasive So minimally techniques? invasive sounds like it's easy uh, on the patient. Right. It's not necessary. It's still a big operation. And usually what, what we do is go into their ribs here on a mitral valve repair mm -hmm. uh, and fix their valve. And it's really cool. I mean, it's and people love it, but it's still a big operation. So. Uh, you can do aortic valves that way, it's a different incision. So there's a lot, everything's shifting toward less invasive, you know, not necessarily mentally invasive and catheters and, uh, you know, they're putting valves in through catheters now. It's very uh, popular in older people um, and, and risky people. So it's, a, it's, it's called structural heart. They're finding ways to put clips on mitral valves. And so there's a lot of stuff coming uh down down the road so okay. but that's exciting yeah so I, I explained to dr bauer as we started i will be checking my phone these are for your questions I'm not surfing twitter 
anything like that. Very okay. try to be engaged in our conversation. <laughs> but we're getting some uh, some questions in from viewers now. Uh, Donna Rogers Porter says best heart surgeon there is right here. So that's a nice compliment. Hey, there you go, Donna. Um, <laughs> so let's. Uh, 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 but Barry Young says thank you for saving my sister. Oh. Uh, Leah Voorhees saved my husband. Best heart surgeon. So. Uh, you, you get a lot of credit for, for saving lives, which must be a, a very good feeling. It is a great feeling. Uh, okay, so let's see. Julie Krause says, I had open heart surgery in August, and in December all the bypasses had clotted off due to factor five, and the bypasses were stented, but she's worried what happens next. Is there something else that can be done about that question? Well, she has a coagulopathic uh, problem. Her blood super wants to clot, and a lot of times... People that have an operation don't know they have that, and they, their grafts will clot. Um, so to uh, actually, she just needs to be treated for that. And the stents are she's already she has stents in her grafts. I'm sure they're open, and she's on Plavix or some drug for that. She may be on Coumadin, but that's a tough uh, th tough deal. Mm -hmm. And at least she knows she's got it now, so if she ever has to have anything else. We operate on people with that, uh, and we have to sometimes, but it's best to know ahead of time, and then you can appropriately thin their blood so they don't lose their grafts. You probably just know she had it. Okay. Uh, Jerry Ann Miller uh, says she is 52. Should I have my heart checked out, she asks. Well, the, the answer to that is um, it, a lot of it depends on your family history, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have uh, a a family member that had a heart attack early in life, like 40s or 50s. Men come in and they say their uncle had a heart attack at 50. That means they have a virulent form of the of the disease, or at least it's in their family. So yes, they should they should be checked out. Certainly, if they have risk factors like smoking or diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, those are all prominent indicators of potential cor coronary artery disease. So they, that, those people need to have it. If they're just flat out healthy and don't have any symptoms, okay, and symptoms would be chest pain, shortness of breath, and as everybody knows, women tend to have not classic symptoms. That's mm -hmm. why they're often misdiagnosed, but mm -hmm. um, it doesn't hurt to get a checkup. I mean, it, 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 it just, it's a good idea. Right, right, probably at any age. Okay, so we've talked about the lead up to surgery. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about surgery itself. Um, the duration of the surgery, the challenges that you encounter when you go in a as a surgeon. I, th they all have to be different in every case, correct? Right, so the interesting thing about it is the, the anatomy is the same. The beauty of, of any surgery is if you know the anatomy, you can count on it to be consistent. But everybody's a little bit different uh, inside. Um, Things are where they're supposed to be, but they're different. Arteries are in different places, and uh, valves are different. So, the, the the there's no simple heart operation, honestly. Mm -hmm. the, the, and if you go in and get complacent, that's where you get burned. The, the 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 cases that we're really worried about, that we you know fret about, uh, and we build up to usually we're prepared for most any contingency. Our team always has what's called a checklist before we start the operation. It's when we get the patients to sleep, we get everybody around the table. It's like a huddle in football. It's like we know we're gonna, you know, kind of play what is our play, and we talk about what the operation is, what the allergies are, what could go wrong, what we do if it goes wrong. Everybody in the room has a say, and anybody in the room can stop stop it at that point if they're not clear about it. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of things in preparation, then we do the operation, so. Um, and they're all different, and so it's um, that's and they they're you know not coronary bypass surgery. If you're really going good, it's two and a half hours, but some of these operations can last five or six hours. Wow. So they're long operations. Yeah. How often do you run into the unexpected, and how difficult is it to to adjust on the fly? <laughs> well, we had one, um, you know, yesterday. It was mm -hmm. turned in turned into we thought it would be a. Uh, a one bypass operation turned into an all-day affair, and it just happens, and you just have to keep going. The thing about it, the good thing about heart surgery, you got a heart lung machine, so they're supported on the machine, and it gives you time to figure stuff out, and you can almost fix anything. And uh, and now that we have this ECMO program and our VAD program, if somebody fails to come off the heart lung machine, 
and there's gonna, they just need time to recover, we can put them on a, a Viagma. It's a little mini heart lung machine. They go out into the ICU and they can stay on that for a week until their, their own heart kind of gets better. Wow. So it's a, there's a lot of stuff now that we can do. The, the medicine has changed significantly, I'm sure, since you entered the field oh, it's, in 88. It, it's, it's always changing. It really has. Let me ask you a question. This is from a Bev Hawthorne. She's 70 years old. She says uh, in just the last four months, she went, underwent a full regime of heart tests. She was having pressure in the left side of her chest with sweats and shortness of breath. She says the doctor she was seeing said the test did not show anything, and the doctor wants to do a heart cath. She says she's hesitant to do so. She asked, what can a heart cath show that the other tests maybe did not show? So the heart cath gives you the exact anatomy of the arteries and where they're blocked, if they're blocked. So if, if, they, if her doctor thinks she needs a heart cath, uh, I'd get it. And uh, the, the risk of a heart cath is very, very low. Okay. Um, they can do it through your, her wrists now, so it's not they don't have to uh, put, puncture the femoral artery, which can be a problem, so it's very, slick, they go home the next that day and uh, they have the answer. They either know they got a problem or they know they don't have the problem. And there's no test quite as good at uh, delineating the anatomy of the coronary arteries as a, as a cath. Okay. No downside to it then too. Well there's downside, you know, nope. there's I mean everything has downside. I mean but very, very rarely is that a problem. Okay. The risk is of not knowing is way worse than the risk of the heart cath. Very good. Uh, just a quick comment. Mike Miller says that you replaced uh, his valve 10 years ago, did a great job. He's about to run his ninth marathon since aortic valve replacement. Uh, stories like that, <laughs> I mean, they, they have to make you feel yeah, good, I right? They make me feel awesome. Yeah. Uh, that's, just, uh, that's, that's, that's what keeps me coming back. That's great. Stuff like that. Uh, here's a question from uh, Damon and Amber Page. Uh, one of their dads is about to have surgery. They asked, do I need to get checked out as well for the same problems as him? So there are congenital uh, things that go through families, um, certainly like we talked about coronary artery disease, uh, uh, for valves, bicuspid aortic valve is a congenital uh, thing and it's transmitted through, the, doesn't like, everybody doesn't get it. Certainly mitral valve, myxomatous disease, I've had uh, families that I fix the mother and the children uh, their vow so if they the the doctor that whatever that they're all different but the doctor will be able to tell them if that's something they need to get checked out okay right. uh, another question here from Nicole she says that I take uh, lisinopril right, right. <laughs> okay and uh, she says it helps my bottom number in my blood pressure uh, she says it helps, but her bottom number in her blood pressure sometimes tends to stay high. What, is, what does that mean, she asks. So that's the bottom number. You need to be under 90, closer to 80. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, just, that's an important number to have, and so it, she may need either more lisinopril or another drug. Okay. And um, so she can take her blood pressure and see where it is and watch it, because it's going to swing around. You know, when you go in a doctor's office, you're tense and nervous and your pressure is going to be high. And then you get all this medicine and you go home and you get relaxed and all of a sudden your blood pressure is low. So you just got to know where you are and you can get a blood pressure cuff and follow that. Okay. And it's a challenge sometimes getting those, all those medicines to work yeah, together so and blood, appropriately. Yeah, blood pressure is known as the silent killer because people don't know they have it. It's a good thing she knows she has it. And it sounds like she's doing a good job of monitoring it. Uh, she just may need a little bit more medicine. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, Mark Leahy says, I have cardiomyopathy. Uh, he asks, why do I get shortness of breath for the least little thing? So cardiomyopathy means that uh, there's all kinds of cardiomyopathy, but basically that means his pump is not pumping, squeezing right. Okay. So, so a normal person's heart has an ejection fraction of 60%. That means that 60% of the blood is ejected of each heartbeat. Somebody that has severe cardiomyopathy may have 10%, okay? The reason that they get, those patients get short of breath is their cardiac output is not as low. It's like um, just leaning over, putting on their shoes can make them short of breath. They're just not pumping a lot of blood. Uh, and they don't have necessarily have chest pain. They don't have coronary artery disease. They, they, just, they just don't have enough cardiac output. And, sh and shortness of breath is a very common symptom of cardiac problems. 
Okay. Donna Weeks asks, can you do heart surgery on people with stents? Absolutely. Do it all the time. Okay. Uh, Paula Huckabee says she has had chest pain, but the lab didn't show anything. She went to a cardiologist. He wants to have a scan of her heart with dye. Um, she also says her son died in March at the age of 44 in an unexpected fashion. Uh, she asks, is this a cautionary procedure to have a dye? Now she, did she say she was having pain? She says she has chest pain, well, yes, so, yeah, but the labs did not show anything. Well, the labs, I don't, you know, the dye test, either a heart cath or it could be a, a, a nuclear test just to see if there's areas of her heart that are not getting enough blood supply. And then it would pro progress to get it in a cardiac cath. So that's probably what they're talking about. Okay. Let's talk about recovering for, from a heart procedure. Um, difficult uh, often, correct? Abs yes, I, but I tell you, it's surprisingly how well tolerated a sternotomy is. People get very nervous about this, and, and it's, it's, it definitely is radical. Uh, but if um, I, I usually make a bet with my patients that are very upset about it. I said, listen, if this is half as bad as you think it's going to be, I'll buy you a steak dinner. Okay. And I've never had to buy any steak dinners. <laughs> and uh, they may just be so happy they're alive they forgot about it. But I, but it's not so bad. You do have to protect it. You can't, you know, do push-ups or anything like that until your bone is healed. It takes about three three uh, months for the bone to set. Uh, and like we were talking about, mentally invasive, you don't have a sternotomy, but you do have your ribs spread. So it can eat both. They're not, it's a, it, it hurts, but it's not as bad as people think. How important is follow-up care? After follow, the well, you gotta, yeah, it's crit critical. So not, once you have like a coronary bypass operation, you have coronary artery disease. Just because you've had the bypasses doesn't mean that you don't still have the disease. So you have to begin to aggressively manipulate the factors you can. So if you're overweight uh, or you're a smoker or you have a bad diet, and certainly if you're diabetic and you're not watching diabetes, you have to get on the game plan fast and be on a statin drug, get all this stuff going your way, and then you can make your, your life better and live a lot longer. So, and, you, and the follow-up is you've got to be on an assistant. I mean, you need a doctor and you need to invest. Most people, a lot of people don't do it. It's a shame, and they're going to be back for another operation, or they're going to drop dead. But uh, So follow-up's big. Cardiac rehab, we always send everybody to rehab, which is a great thing. There's a patients around that have had the same thing. There's a lot of talk, and people, they, get, they can see what they can do on the treadmill, and they feel comfortable with somebody watching them. So, yeah, follow-up's big. Well, what advice do you give to people about pain management following their so surgery? So pain, pain is pain's pain. Everybody tolerates pain at different levels. Um, but usually it's not too bad. Um, if you... If, if you, everybody has a little bit of pain, but it gets better. The problem you have to worry about if your pain gets almost gone and then it starts coming back in your chest or some other problem, then that's a real problem you need to talk to your doctor about. Because um, that may mean something's not going right, you have a complication. You mentioned earlier that just about anything could be fixed. Um, here's a question, does angioplasty and stenting or bypass surgery fix a heart? So, it, yeah, it fixes the heart, the problem by rerouting blood or directing blood to the muscle that needs the blood, but it doesn't correct the disease. And that's done by the, you know, like what I was saying. And people who just have coronary disease, they're not going to get rid of it. There's no pill to take to get rid of coronary right. disease, but you can slow it down. Uh, does surgery mean that a person can't return to an active lifestyle? Doesn't mean that. If, they're, if they go in with a good heart muscle, good motor, and they get a good operation and they don't have a problem with their operation, then once they heal, they can do anything they want to do. Yeah, return to an active lifestyle. Right. Let's see, uh, we have a question from Angie uh, and David Lair. Uh, my blood pressure had been staying really low, around 90 over 50. What can someone do to raise that, raise blood pressure? Um, eat a lot of salt, uh, you know. There's nothing wrong with bl that blood oh, pressure. Okay. Yeah, that's a great blood pressure. I, I mean, was gonna yeah, say. I mean, it's not. It's kind of low, but if they're not lightheaded, uh, and, and they're, they, I mean, if your blood pressure is too low, you're going to be lightheaded when you stand up and things like that. So, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy with that one. Um, what should people know about 
alternative treatment options as opposed to surgery? So you, if you, you know, you can have stents like we were talking about. You can have nothing. You know, I've, I've had, there's one uh, doctor here in town that was diagnosed with severe three-vessel coronary disease, and he was just adamant that not to have an operation, and we all thought he was going to not do so well, and he showed us all. I mean, he's, he hasn't had one, uh, to my knowledge, and you can modify your risk factors and, like I said, get on a very good diet. Now, you can't make coronary artery disease dissolve away, you know. People think that there's, they, they read about stuff, that you can take a pill and it's going to dissolve it. It's not going to go away, but you can slow it down and actually learn to live with it. So, um, and you just, you know, all, there are alternatives to, you know, anything, but, I mean, there's alternatives to the valve operations we do. There's different kind of valves, and so, but um, sometimes you just, comes down to the fact that there's not going to be anything other than an operation to get you back on the path. So um, I think that's probably what you're asking. Okay. When people go out and, and they're looking for a surgeon, how do, how do they weigh their experience? How do, they, how do they go about choosing a doctor the right way? So the way I would do it, if I was, if I, first of all, you're probably going to have a, a recommendation by the doctor that makes the diagnosis, the cardiologist who may have a relationship or know the surgeon that they want you to see. And that, that usually, uh, hopefully, if you trust that cardiologist, then you're going to believe that he's going to send you to a good surgeon, okay, or somebody, to somebody who's going to be capable of doing the operation that he's proposing that you need. But I wouldn't take anything, any of that. On, I, I would, the way I would do it, just for folks out there, is I would check around. Usually you have a nurse friend that works in a hospital that you're going to go to, and the nurses know who the good doctors are, and they'll usually find that out or they'll ask around. And then, you, like I said, you'll have your chance to interview your surgeon, and you're going to get a feel about whether you can trust him, and you need to ask him directly how many he's done, and don't be shy of asking what his mortality is. And like, I mean, you're interviewing him. After all, he's going to have your, your life in his hands, and you have every right to have, ask any question about his experience uh, that you want. Okay. I was going to end it with that, but then um, we had Colin Cot uh, Cottingham weigh in with the question, does red wine bother the heart? So we will, we will end it with a question about red wine. Red wine's good for your heart. It's good for the heart. I mean, not a gallon of red wine, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in moderation, yeah, correct? That's right. All right. Doctor, thanks so much well, for being a good here. Time. Dr. Thank Mike you. Bauer, uh, yeah. we know you may have even more questions. We appreciate all the questions you have uh, sent in tonight, but they can answer all the questions you have at the CHI St. Vincent Heart Institute. You can find information about them uh, on the web at chistvincent.com slash heart and on Facebook and Twitter at CHI. St. Vincent. We thank you so much for being with us tonight for this Facebook Live event. We uh, thank you for being patient with us as we worked out our technical difficulties. We thank you for all your questions as well. Uh, this has been a KTV production uh, here on Facebook Live. Good night.